You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. So today, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. Today we are in the improvised Gritty Studio at the Mountain Ops Base Camp, home base, headquarters, HQ, uh fun factory why are we here and we're here we are joined by the gould brothers hey what's going on guys howdy good to be here the gold 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 okay is it gold or is it gold let's just settle this right now okay we say gould but i've been we've been doing a lot of thinking about marketing strategy and gold would just be so much easier to use the gold brothers. i feel like that's what i'm going to call you i feel like Like you guys are sitting on a Gold mine. Yeah, it's you know? like we're as good as gold. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> it just would work better. It would work way better. Because then, okay, well, then you say and gold. By the way, people, you are hearing from S- Steve, Stephen, uh, either one. St- either, Steve, whatever you want to call him. We're hearing from Steve Gold, like Steve Jobs. And yeah. he is the outspoken, talkative brother who is the uh, junior of the quiet brother. Quiet, reserved, and resourceful, um, intense, smoldering eyes, smoldering eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'll go with it though. Yeah. So, and Aaron. <laughs> That's Aaron. Aaron. Aaron Gold. But I do think Gold is is. Uh, it's nice. Just need to take I that mean, not, you out of the. Hey, it's it's your show. <laughs> we'll, we'll roll with yeah, it. Let's just... Steve and Aaron Gold, people <laughs> have joined us and. Uh, we had a great time today. You guys came and joined us for a, uh, uh, team workout. Yeah. We're going to call it team. Jordan called it couples. We, we've kind of hammered that. Uh, I, I think the rest of us like team better than couples. Yep. Jordan was the only one with the couples. Well, and then Brian called it partners, you know, yeah, that so, one sort of creeped so me we've out got, so we've got couples, we've got partners, or we could have just called it team team. Yep. Uh, and we had, uh, we had a good, uh, wad. You guys learned what a wad is yes. today. Uh, mm-hmm. Steve said to Workout me, um, I heard the day I heard Brian say what a lot. That was off camera and off, yeah. off, you know, <laughs> off the record. Off the record? Like, <laughs> what, what does that exactly mean? I said, well, in the, uh, the CrossFitter community, that stands for workout of the day, yeah. which yeah. every community technically creates a workout of the day, but right. the uh, CrossFit community has really coined that as theirs, That's right. which is we do wads. I just got to. Like when something's off the record, that sort of means like don't put it out there. Publicly. Don't worry, dude. You're not a CrossFitter. Yeah. You're not a CrossFitter. Well, but you. what you did today, <laughs> what you did today was CrossFitting. You crossed and over. You crossed over into the fitness side of CrossFit, and you did an amazing job. Both of you, in fact, Brian and I were both saying it, mm-hmm. and we were talking about earlier in the car. Uh, really impressed. I think it's I think it's fascinating sometimes, and it's also sad. Because people will be, oh, they're, they're flatlanders. You know, you joke about it the other day. You're like, well, I'm a flatlander. You guys did very well in an environment with the, the cardiovascular uh, exercises and movements we were doing and the kettlebell, 100 kettlebells between teammates. And yeah. um, unfortunately, as it went down. Um, uh, fortunately. No. Uh, Steve and I were the winners. That's right. <laughs> Team Goldilocks. Like there was going to be as Aaron any and I are calling question. Them. That's right. Uh, Gold Sun came in a very close second place it with a like, half rep behind. Like one-tenth of a second. Yeah. I, Just I, a little bit. I went back and I reviewed 10. Yeah, if you're not first, you're last. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> so, uh, by, so I want to get into this, and uh, this show is not about Jordan and I. It's about you guys. So we're going <laughs> to turn the focus over to you. 
I have a lot of questions. I got to know you this morning. We had some lunch. We're back here in the studio. And now uh, it's it's my turn to get to know you. Uh, I had some fascinating conversations with you both. I'm very interested to learn start to finish, you know, more about you guys uh, to get started. Take a moment and tell me about your, like, where you came from and what you're doing right now. Because yeah. you guys have a really cool story. Yeah, so obviously brothers, right? Four years apart, don't look anything alike. Personalities, really not a whole lot alike. Um, didn't get along growing up. And, uh, you know, as far as hunting, shooting aspect, Aaron grew up with that passion, right? I loved it from the beginning, yeah. Yeah, one of our uncles got him into it, and he just took to it from the get-go, and he just continued to explore that on his own and grow, and I always had that passion. Not so much here. I was just punk kid, you know, kind of doing punk kid things. And um, Still you know, was a punk sometimes. Still am from time to time, but I would – shoot i'd shot some i had hunted just a little bit but it's nothing that really just in my core and my soul was like something i was attached to well we both had life-changing experiences in college that totally changed our worldviews really how we look at the world and changed a lot of our values and for me one of the things that immediately changed was like this connection with the outdoors like all of a sudden i wanted i was going to school in north dakota and i just wanted to get out and experience the outdoors start hunting ducks and so i just started hunting out there and that's sort of the time that aaron and i were brought together. We had now this common... What was the age gap? Uh, four years. Aaron's four years older. So he's out of college. I'm still in college. And now we start hunting together. Well, and the summers come around, nothing to hunt. So let's just shoot some clays. So I bought my first shotgun and started shooting clays. And oh my goodness, was I horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like bad. Bad. Hey, I can attest to it. I mean... You, you were pretty terrible. I was, but you know, there was, there was something there that like, I wasn't just going to settle for that. Like mm -hmm. two out of 25, I know I can do better than that. Like, what am I missing? And I'm a, I'm a little worried to shoot tomorrow. Yeah. Well, yeah, you guys should be worried because I actually can shoot. I'm not saying I can shoot as good as the gold brothers, but, uh, I feel like that's where you and I are going to make up today's loss. We're going to beat them tomorrow. Uh-huh. I feel confident. <laughs> I'm excited to go. That's it. great that you guys have this false delusional <laughs> sense of oh, that just, you're going to win. This, this was just, but you heard. You. We have synergy. Brian and I have yes. synergy. And you you're going to have to carry the team tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> just tell them right Whatever, dude. I've done my share of duck hunting. And, and shape. I've shot some Yeah, on Nintendo. He's there. really good at it. But, uh, yeah, continue. So uh, we're now shooting clays together. And uh, Aaron had recalled seeing this guy back when he was in high school do some of these just trick shots, like shoot with a gun over the head and, and different stuff. And you didn't even think it was I, real. Yeah, I remember seeing these videos and I was just like, there's got to be trick photography. No one can actually do that because I consider myself a pretty decent shot. I was primarily a hunter. Um, and no one's going to put the gun upside down over their head and shoot a clay. It's just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not going to happen. This guy was doing it over and over again and from different positions and Anyway, so it's kind of unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And uh, so Aaron had seen that. We just started hand throwing some clays. Just, you know, we'd sh hand throw one, shoot it. Great. Can we get two? Let's just keep up in it. It was sort of addicting. It became a passion of ours over the course of that summer and into the next. In 2009, we went and saw this man put on a live exhibition show. Not an exhibitionist show, an <laughs> exhibition show. We discussed that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> a totally different. There thing. is a clear difference. Right. Exhibition <laughs> is like a public display of talent public display of talent so a talent show yeah a talent show and when you include shotguns now you're a shotgun <laughs> exhibition shooter so we went and saw this guy named tom knapp and he puts on this amazing show like we're sitting there watching this guy throw up all these clays do all these different shots high precision just super consistent and meanwhile we're looking around and you got little kids you got adults men women everybody in between laughing having a good time amazed it was sort of just this experience we're like oh shoot, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We can do that. That's what we can do. We can put together our own show and go out in our own way and perform live exhibition shows. This sort was of 2009. Okay. 2009. That's like the moment the dream was born. Okay. And so we knew we could work on the shots, and that's what we dedicated the rest of that summer to, just work on these shots. And that fall, we put together a live show for our friends and family. And uh, ranting reviews, our mom loved it. Yeah, she was <laughs> our biggest fan. Yes, and uh, so we knew we got something. Mom loves this. We got it. And uh, so we knew we could sort of put together a show, do some of these shots. We just had to start putting ourselves out there and take it one step after another. Yeah. And that's what we did. We started creating content, calling around, doing shows. Like our first show, though, 
I'll say this, just like when I first started shooting, it was horrible. Our first show was horrible. Like I'm we glad were, there's no video that I'm aware of of that show. Yeah, I have some. And oh. just a little, uh, some of the video actually aired on the Winchester um, Life episode, part two that we were just on. And, I haven't uh, watched that yet. Pretty, no, I'm going to watch it tonight. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty fascinating to watch, you know, to, to take a step back and see where you've come from. And, you know, in today's standards, we look at it and go, look how horrible we were. But at that time, we didn't know any better. We were just putting ourselves out there, no matter where we were, well, to see where we could go. That's one thing I was going to ask you was you just went from, hey, we've got this idea, we like shooting, to, hey, we're going to do an exhibition, you, you do this one with your family and all that, and the dream was born. But at what point did you, like, really stick yourself out there in the public eye? Right after we did that show for friends and family. That was, like, the moment where we said, okay, we can do this. We, we saw enough momentum and enough belief in ourselves that we could grow into this. And so we sort of went to our wives, and I think, what, did we tell them it was like a three-year deal? Three years. We we're going to give it a shot for three years. And just so that, like, they didn't think <laughs> we were crazy, we're like, hey, all our extra money, guns, ammo, clays, for three years. We wanted to put a cap on it so they wouldn't just be like, oh, they've lost their minds. What did I get into? I shouldn't have married so young. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and that was also to push us. Let's see what we can do in the next three years. Yeah. And every year, just momentum, momentum, momentum. And so we just kept going with it and going with it until we were eventually both able to go full time. And what is full time? Like, what is your – explain that to people that are listening. What? That, that means that we don't go to regular 9 to 5, 8 to 5 type jobs. You know, I, I don't know how most people define okay. full time, but, like, this is how we make our living. We perform live shows. Now we create content. And, uh, and where do people find your content? Yeah, a lot of times YouTube. If you just go to YouTube, search Gould Brothers, or if you were to go to GouldBrothers.com, we have most of it there, or follow you, us on Instagram. How do you spell that? G-O-U-L-D. There you go. Not G-O-L-D, guys. But the U could be silent if you wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Gold Brothers, yep. Gould yep. Brothers, and then and it's YouTube. And how many videos do you guys have out there? Oh, boy, I don't, I don't even know. Right over now, 100, I don't know. Yeah, well over 100. We're trying to put out a video at least every other week, sometimes okay. more than that. turns out that when we're traveling and, and uh, doing the different things that we're doing, it gets challenging to come back and put out content on a very regular basis. But that's something we really uh, want to be able to put out and reach people through. So you do live shows. How many live shows are you doing? Uh, th- I mean, 30 to 50 a year. It just depends on the events and Whoa. where they're going and um, some years more, some years less. Okay, so 30 to 50 shows, and what's the, the, the busiest time of year for you guys? Usually what? August. August, September. Yeah, really. Yep. August, September. July's always slow. Everyone's doing vacations yeah. and stuff, but uh, spring and fall are definitely our busy times. Wow. So 30 to 50 shows a year, and uh, describe a show. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the hard thing. We've done, I mean, we're always trying to find good ways to describe it. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because we'll, we'll describe it to somebody and they'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds neat. I'm <laughs> like, hey, just go watch a video. Go to YouTube, watch a video. Right. And then they'll come back to us and be like, ah, oh, I had no idea that's what you did. Yeah. I'm like, I must suck at describing, <laughs> explaining this. It's really a hard thing to wrap your whole brain around until you've actually seen what, yeah. what that means. But I'll do, we'll do our best. So for 40, 45 minutes, you've got Aaron and I coming out there with a whole table full of shotguns, clays, vegetables, golf balls, basketballs, just all sorts of stuff. And we're telling stories. Um, we're make, I'm, I'm mainly making fun of Aaron. And then he's just. And I'm doing the talent work with the shotguns. And, 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 and he's just trying to talk. He's, he's the, it's like the A team. He's the mouth. And this is Mr. T over here. Like, I'm actually going to get, you know, I pity the fool that makes fun of me because yeah. I can actually shoot a shotgun. He, he just tries to talk through a shotgun. I try to do both. But, um, yeah, as you guys can see, a little bit different dynamics and personality. But we take that, what's already natural yeah. to us, like with me being more talkative, energetic, and he's more of the, the calm, collective type. And uh, we just play off that. And we yeah. have fun throughout our show. And, you know, just like how we were inspired by that Tom Knapp show, we try to do the same thing. So we want kids smiling, men, women, children. You know, everyone there having a great time and and leaving going, wow, that was a lot of fun. And um, I think our show has been able to do that. And it's been really encouraging for us to see that, inspiring for us, you know, because a lot of times we can go up there and just feel like, you know, uh, we're we're nothing special to us. We're just two guys following our dream and giving Mm -hmm. it our best. But then to have people come up to us and and say, hey, you know, like maybe it's a a female and she says, I'm not into guns. I'm not into shooting. I wasn't going to come. This has happened several times. And then she'll go, 
but that was awesome. That was really fun. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. You showed me that gonna, guns are not just a scary object. Well, mm. I was going to say, like, what about the fact that you're at this show, you're doing this, this thing, you're, you're swinging a gun around. Like, does that not make people nervous? Well, if you keep it They're down probably range. not there. Those ones that are nervous are probably aren't there. But, you know, I think people do come in with, like, hey, what's going to be going on here? And at some point in our show, we will bring up, like, I'll tease that I'm going to do the shot where I throw clays, and then I spin a 180 really fast. And then I'm like, oh, you maybe shouldn't be sitting there. <laughs> and then we just – that's a joke, of course. And we right. use that as an opportunity to ask the audience, like, does anyone know what the first rule of gun safety is? And we try to find a kid that maybe can say it. And, um, you know, that's when we point out, like, hey, this muzzle – always in a safe direction. It's never going to cross you guys. It's not going to cross us. You know, and we explain yeah. that in every shot we do, we're thinking about the, the fundamentals of firearm safety. Yeah. Because some people do look at it and say, like, hey, that's horseplay. It, that's, yeah, some, that's screwing around. Some people will look at it and say that's horseplay and, and that it's unsafe. But something that we do before we do any shots, either in our videos or in our, especially our live performances, is that we look at the safety aspect of it. Um, we throw guns back and forth to each other. But something we say in our live shows and we make clear you in our videos, the guns are unloaded. We never mm-hmm. throw a loaded gun. Yeah. You know, there's just things you don't do. And even though it may look different than mm-hmm. gun safety class, we are doing it following the rules of gun safety. Well, it's sort of like the air show, you know, or, or any anything where they're doing stunts and stuff. I mean, part of in a car when you're jumping – 20 cars or a motorcycle you're jumping uh, you know 20 cars in a lineup that i mean part of the stunt has an element of riskiness involved in it that's part of mm-hmm. the show that's part of what makes it you know as as a person makes it uh, intriguing compelling yeah. to watch i say the same thing about like nascar like if people say hey you, you know you're sort of teaching people bad stuff to drive first, fast first we say hey like we're following all the rules of gun safety Muzzle in a safe direction, gun unloaded until you're ready to shoot, finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Like, if you do those things and handle the firearm in an appropriate way, like, you can be safe. And we're not necessarily out there to, like, get people into exhibition shooting, but to open their eyes to the firearms and the outdoors. And, and yeah. we've had that happen, too, where people say, hey, you know, like, I was a workaholic, and I came to your show, and it just rekindled that feeling of wanting to be in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. And now me and my sons, all we do is go hunting. You know, and for us, that's, like, the most rewarding feeling we can get out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, but, like, back to the NASCAR, you know, we all watch NASCAR. That doesn't mean you should get in your car and start driving 200 miles an hour. <laughs> right. Like, that's what NASCAR guys do. Right. And they're on a closed track. Yeah. You know? And they're yeah. just going left and left <laughs> and left and left. With you guys very... actually are doing something, no, nothing against NASCAR drivers. I think it's incredible because of the what they have to do as drivers. But mm-hmm. it's really cool to hear how you guys are operating and how you guys do your show. Like, I, uh, I mean... It, I think uh, Brian and I have seen a lot of people over time that I've been fortunate to be on the podcast with or listen to the podcast that he does. And what I always get fascinated by is just how a, a person or individuals come to conclusions like you guys did of wanting to do something like this. And then you stated it earlier where you're like, man, you look back and we were such rookies. Like we were, man, we didn't know how to aim this thing right. Or we really weren't that efficient. And now you guys, I mean, if you guys go look at your channel and I always am watching your guys' videos and that's how I got to know these guys. They did this one video. It's so awesome. Everybody that's listening needs to go see it. It's actually (laughs) one of the earlier ones of the trick shot era was a workout shotgun trick shot video. And that's when I was like. I got to work with these guys <laughs> because it was because I'm like, dude, let's check out. These guys are working out with a shotgun. They're shooting clays as, as Aaron's over there doing a, he does a one handed push up and then shoots a clay, does another one handed push up, shoots a clay. And then they, I mean, there's so many different, you know, trick shots, you guys that were incorporating with a workout type thing. Yeah. And, uh, that's just kind of the entertainment that you guys are providing for people on your channel, on your Instagram and Facebook and different mediums. And it's extremely entertaining. But the one thing that I think you guys said that I just really want to highlight is like it, it's not easy. It's taken a lot of time for you guys to get proficient, to be effective and also to make sure that you're maintaining that gun safety while you're doing all these fun trick shot things that people typically would look at and go, this is weird. Like, is that even safe? Right. But you guys are the professionals. You guys are, are doing it right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And well, you know, I like I went went to Mexico and there were these fire dancers on stage. <laughs> and if you were to 
describe if they were to describe what they do i'd be like okay you dance with fire great uh probably not safe you're blowing like torches everywhere toward the audience and so on and everything but you have to see it in person you have to watch it i think to really appreciate what's there but again it goes back to you know someone with with talent and skill putting on a show is, you know with a with a with a dangerous substance or dangerous object uh it's just dude it's what humans want to see yeah <laughs> we're like wired that way mm. and uh so anyway very well, that, cool that kind of brings up something interesting is there's a big difference between video and a live performance you know there's there's a whole different aspect to that live performance that you bring both in personality you yeah. know all of us that have watched a live show you know the live show is better than video is um plus you could you could miss the shot 50 times on a video and make it once on the video now you have your video that doesn't happen when, it, when it's live <laughs> you, you you basically you can either do it or you can't you either have the skill or you don't have the skill it's not a video editing skill that you have it's an actual skill right right and being able to perform in front of a live audience you know there that's a whole different dynamic yeah. because yeah you know People may not realize this, but we sometimes have bad days. Mm. We have bad days as shooters. We have bad, we're crabby that day, whatever it may be. And I'm, I'm never crabby. Well, you try and get rid of the crabbiness, <laughs> but we all know that we perform better some days than others. Yes. Uh, no matter what we're doing. Yes. And sometimes you're up there, and that was one of the hardest lessons as performers that we actually had to learn was – doesn't it, matter how sucky your day is, how horrible you think you are shooting. You are there for the people that are watching you. That's and right. they are not going to have fun if you're not having you're fun. You're a professional. So after Suck safety. Yeah. After safety, rule number one. And dance, boy. Dance. <laughs> rule, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> rule number 1.5 yeah. is have fun. Keep smiling. Shake it off. Put your pride aside. Because, you know, we go out there and want to perform at our best every time. One thing we've found in nine years of performing, we've never had a perfect show. There's always something that just doesn't go quite right. Whether it's a missed shot, whether it's a missed line, you know, we're not meshing well, whatever it yeah. is. And that doesn't matter nearly as much as how much energy we're bringing and how much we're trying to relate with this audience and making an experience for them. Now, you made a comment earlier about how you guys aren't anything special, right? You're, you're just two guys that are doing what you love to do. I say that, too, about gr Gritty, you know, about w my journey, uh, Jordan. There's, there's, there's – uh, I think there are a lot of people out there that want to pursue a dream or an interest, or they are dying in their 9-to-5 job mm -hmm. where it's sucking their soul away. I mean, what do you guys contribute to the success you've experienced, the, to, the, to the spot you're in today? Like, what, what, is, what, what are some of those key things that have put you here? Well, first and foremost, I think it's – you know, our faith. We put our faith and trust in God, and that changed our lives. You know, it all of a sudden stopped being so much about us and our pursuit of us as a pursuit of something greater. And that was that life changing experience we both had in college. And, you know, from there, it's interesting to look back because now we can see so clearly how our paths were heading two totally different directions, you know, and how we were sort of 180 and brought together on this path. And we can see purpose and purpose and purpose. You know, and we're always trying to discover now what's our purpose now what's our purpose what's behind it all or what are we supposed to be doing but i think having that purpose in our life out, outside of just us and pursuing our desires of the moment you know was was huge being it, able to step out put yourself out there you know as as we mentioned the first shows were according to today's standards were kind of crummy but you had to step out you had to start somewhere you had to get out there you had to maybe Go through a couple shows where people kind of chuckled at a few of your misses and the way you were performing to get to that next level, to keep working, to keep moving forward and shake off the critics and move forward. It, it Ordinary people do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. what, and what allows you to do that, I believe, is having a clear vision of where you're taking this thing. Like if you're just two guys out doing a few trick shots, like when you start to face adversity and struggle, you're going to give up. But like when you know where you want to take this, and you feel compelled that this is part of your purpose, you are going to persevere. You're going to push through the struggles and the trials, you know, when it gets dirty and messy in the middle to, yeah. keep, to keep pushing. And, you know, like I'll speak out of both sides of my mouth. I said, we're nothing special. Well, I guess I believe that everybody's something special. And they've been uniquely special and uniquely created. And, like, once you can get clear on 
where you're supposed to go and get some clear directions. We talked a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. just having clear direction in your life and where it is you're wanting to go, you can start to take the actions and, and change your beliefs uh, and identity and start living that life. So Jordan and I talk about this a lot and about the why of everything, like start with why, you know, in life, in business and everything. So, you know, what is the reason for, you know, whatever the venture is that you're embarking on, you know, for you guys to, to go down the road that you've gone down? What, you know, Aaron, I'm going to ask you, like, what was your why? Like, what's your reason, your clear vision for why? Our clear, clear vision for why is to inspire the next generation. Um, what, that's not conducive to just age. You know, it could be, but the next generation of shooters, no matter what their age is, outdoors, um, as well as we want to inspire people to take that action towards faith. And that's really where um, our purpose lies. You say the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's common threads in there. You know, something that's really become passionate to me over the last several years is like we've had we have this faith foundation. That's a you know underlying foundation in all that we do. You know, and through the exhibition shows, inspiring people to get outdoors, be part of creation, conservation, those threads through that. But then, like just really seeing that people have the opportunity to thrive in life. They don't have to just be complacent and just kind of survive their whole life and and kind of get into this rut. But like life is filled with amazing things it's, it can be joy filled it can it can be incredible like and people are living far below their potential so like mm -hmm. helping people see that and get intentional i call it getting target focused where you see the target get focused on it move towards it pull the trigger and continue to follow through those are some of the steps like you can create and live up more close to your potential so tell me like if you're comfortable with it you know you mentioned earlier being on different paths and some things happen that change it. Can you share like what changed? What is it that you experienced that made you decide to go down a whole new road? Well, <laughs> uh, we both grew up. I'll let Steve tell a little bit of his story, but we both grew up uh, going to church and, and doing the whole thing, but we never made it part of our actual inside. We never made it part of our heart, part of our life. We just went through the motions and, and for me, as a young teenager, I decided that I was going to do whatever I wanted in pursuit of basically my own personal pleasure. And so for the next, oh, about 10 years, that's how I lived up until my senior year of college. And during that senior year, weird thoughts started coming to my mind, like, you know, things I hadn't felt guilty about. I knew were wrong, but I didn't feel guilty about. Mm -hmm. um, I started thinking about them again. And it, it kind of blindsided me. I was like, I haven't thought about this or that it's wrong for 10 years. Why is it coming up? And that was that things like that were happening uh, all over my life for about six months. And then um, and then I committed my life to Jesus um, the fall of my senior year of college. And uh, it was the best decision I ever made. Completely 180 my life in many different ways. But, um, you know, it was there was a lot of people well, praying for me. What was your, so what, what were the sort of things you told yourself before and then the sort of things that, that you, you said to yourself after, like mentally, uh, about how, how, how you live? Um, well, I was self-consumed. I drank as much as I wanted. I uh, was promiscuous, you know, all, all of those things. I just did whatever I wanted, yeah. whatever felt good. And even though from the teachings I had grown up with, I knew they were wrong. But I just suppressed that until I never thought about it anymore. And that's kind of where I was going with that six months prior to my life changing. Um, I started to feel that conviction come back and, and realize that I was on the wrong path. So when you started to change some of those habits and those decisions, um, how, I mean, how did you get rid of the whole uh, folks self self focus thing and actually redirect that? outward I um, guess, well I you know I'm gonna say you know Jesus made a great change just like that many of the things I was involved in you know almost stopped immediately yet like I like to say when I'm actually talking at a church or whatever there's other things that took a little longer for me to give away are taking longer are, are taking are ta <laughs> yes Steve. that was that was that was 13 years ago yeah. that that change happened and he's still changing me today yeah. uh, I'm still working towards that sanctification and and uh, he, I mean, it's amazing 
the last couple of years I've been in a transformative part of my life where just trying to get rid of the bad attitudes, such as uh, negativity and mm-hmm. things like that, and being joyful, joyful every day. We, we choose to be joyful. We choose to be happy with how we look at our day. And that's not the way I lived, but a little bit mm-hmm. all the time, God is changing me. I think what's super interesting is like as you conquer w- one part and just make you develop and improve, like your eyes are open to another part part that can be improved so like i don't know that that ever stops you just keep getting revealed to you where you can still grow yeah and so like you know things change up front when we both commit our lives to the lord and and now we're just a continual work in progress you know just trying to to, trying to grow and you know for me my story was a little bit uh different of course we grew up together kind of took the same attitude hey this life is short it's about me why don't i get what i can get right now and not let anyone else get in the way and I continued that attitude, started dating a girl in high school and into college. We were dating for about five years, and I started thinking about marriage, like, hey, what's after this? Oh, we'll probably get married. But as I'd sit there and le- in bed and think about that, like, I just kept having this conviction or something come over me that was just saying, like, Steve, you want to be with this girl and have a lasting relationship? You ain't living your life right. What the heck? Where is this coming from? I didn't know, didn't know what to do with it, so I just went on with my life. Well, buddy asked me to come to church. I didn't go to church when I was in college because my parents weren't there to make me. (laughs) Take that, Dad. (laughs) But um, so I said yes. I don't know why. It was a college-age church service. I just, uh, yeah, I'll check it out. So me and my girlfriend, a few friends, went with and checked it out. It was a baptismal service, and I thought, this is going to be great. Spend a Saturday night watching people (laughs) get dunked. And, uh, but what happened, and I had no idea how this night would change the whole rest of my life, is as each young person would go up, they would give their story, you know, of where they were and what was going on in their life, the junk that was going on, maybe things that they endured, the hurt, the pain, and how their life started to really change when they accepted Christ as their Savior. And so, like, it was that moment of time, you know, as the tears are coming down my face and I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> hide them from my girlfriend. I ain't crying. There's, there's something in there. Grown men don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> but I knew. I I knew what was missing. Like, I knew why I'd been having those feelings when I was thinking about marriage, that it wasn't going to be successful because I didn't have the right foundation. So that was the night where I made the change, gave my life to the Lord, and then I had to tell my girlfriend, which was going to be really hard. We didn't talk about this, didn't know what she was going to do. We'd been dating five years, kind of thought this was, you know, my life was with her. So I worked up the courage to tell her this, what had happened, that we had to be on the same page, I believed, if we were going to be successful. And when I laid it all out and it was done, I sent the email, and it was off. <laughs> I love that part. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, I you're, could, a, you're a real well, Tom Hanks. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. there, just, just well, sending I just, it. It was going to be hard to get out, you know, so uh-huh. I wanted to make you sure. You got to put it out on paper. You got mail. Yeah. You yeah. Said, and all of a sudden, mail. ding, you got mail. You got Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ding. <laughs> uh, so I nervously awaited her reply, and uh, what she said was quite amazing to me, and that was that that night, 100%, she believed the same thing and, and uh, agreed with me that we need to be living our lives for the Lord. And so, I mean, that was just a total God moment in my life. And now that's my wife of 10 years, and we mm-hmm. got two beautiful children. And, you know, for, I think for both of us just to look back and, you know, to see that there, there's purpose in this world and there's things way bigger uh, beyond ourselves. And, and we've we we talked about that this morning. Yeah, uh, I like Jordan Peterson, Jordan B. Peterson. Uh, I follow a lot of his stuff. I listen to his podcasts on his Bible lecture series podcast. Uh, very intellectual person, but I I love his message. Message, and he talks about right now young men today, especially young women, m- men primarily, are are going through life in our country, um, and, and other countries as well, where where they're 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 kind of taught this meaninglessness of life. Like life doesn't really have a purpose, you know, it's just kind of all accidental. So it doesn't really matter, you know, if you're like good or bad or mm-hmm. indulge whatever and do whatever, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't really mean anything anyway. And so uh, there's no responsibility. Like you can kind of just uh, go down this road and whatever happens, happens, mm-hmm. you know, to just indulge, you know, seek that pleasure, whatever. Um, as long as, you know, so-and-so doesn't find out, it'll never hurt him. And you kind of go down this road where there's no meaning, right? Nothing you do really matters. And along with that, there's no responsibility. 
So there's just this party on feeling, right? Like, and our, a lot of our young people are, are drifting along kind of with that nihilistic viewpoint of, of the, the world. Yeah. And he's like, or, or the, here's the alternative. Everything you do matters. Like the cosmos matters. Like who, who knows, but for some reason there's this, this compelled feeling in us to, to tell the truth and to do what's right. So if everything you do matters, now all of a sudden there's, like Jocko Willing says, extreme ownership, right? Mm-hmm. There's responsibility. But guess what? There's meaning too. Mm-hmm. With yeah. meaning comes responsibility. With a lack of responsibility, there's no meaning. So take your pick. I don't want to go through life without meaning. It doesn't make sense to me. There's no point in it. It's meaningless. So that means if, 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 if I'm going to go through life and have purpose and have meaning, that means everything I do matters. It means I have a responsibility to live my life in a, in a truthful, moral way. And when you take on that responsibility, young men, young people, people, doesn't matter how old you are, I guess, you know, but when you take on that, that attitude about yourself and about the world, all of a sudden, the world is a, is a million times a better place. It, it's, it's, and, and you have meaning. Like you have drive, you have goals, you have ambitions because you believe in responsibility. And I, I feel like too many people in the world today are in that boat, and he's seeing, Jordan Peterson, seeing this massive, this call of all these people that are following him through social media and so on and on his YouTube channel because they're, they're resonating with this message about responsibility and meaningfulness, like purpose. And I think that's what, I mean, Jordan and I are both uh, extremely uh, religious, faithful, and, and we have a... Um, you know, there's purpose in, in all that we do. Mm -hmm. So, um, I found that interesting and something that also you, you mentioned the target focused life, Mm -hmm. right? That really tied in with what Jordan Peterson is saying. And you hadn't really heard of him until today, right? Where Jordan Peterson is talks about the future authoring program. And, uh, it really coincides to the exact same thing you were describing to me today. So I would like you to tell myself and, and the listeners, what a target focused life is, what, what you envision that, that thing. Yeah. Well, you know, right now it's just a work in progress and, you know, I don't know exactly where I'm supposed to take it, but I've just really had it placed on my heart that there's a lot of people out there just drifting, drifting through life without having clear destination and, and real no purpose. And they're going to end up at a destination they would have never chose. And I think that's sad. And now that I've sort of had my eyes open, cause I didn't live my life that way for the first many years of my life. But now clearly seeing that like, hey, you can set a vision on a destination, you can get focused on it, and you can start to take action, and there's ways to do that and live your life intentional, it's become very, very passionate for me, you know, where I I just, I don't feel content standing by and just watching everyone float through life. And I realize that, you know, I can have an impact on people, whether that's, you know, 10 people, 100 people, or 10,000 people, but you know, when I, when I look at towards the end of my life, you know, I want to leave a legacy where I can say, or other people can say, like, he invested in other people, and this world was different and better because he did so. And I feel like I could sit back and just continue to do everything the same and, you know, go travel to cool places and go on cool hunts and do cool trick shooting videos, you know, and that's going to be something we continue to do for many, many years, Lord willing. But there's something greater to empowering people and changing their lives and having an impact. And I think through Aaron and I, what we do, we have several opportunities to do that in kind of a few different threads. And so that's something I'm really passionate about developing as we move forward. Yeah. That, that, uh, I like what, what you said there. And I, I think people are drifting through life a lot. I know I did. I know we probably all have at some points where you're just kind of, you're just, you know, I'm playing basketball three nights a week in the city league. I'm going to the beach. You know, I work from home like three days a week, which means I really go to the beach three days a week. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, like that, that, that kind of thing is, uh, you know, I've, I've done that life. Right. But having a target focused life or having this, this, this thing where I write down, you know, what are the things about me and the future 
uh, what are the things I want to change about who I am and where do I want to be 10 years, 12 years, 15, 20, 30, 50 years from now when I die? Like, what, what is it? And you start writing that down and, and uh, then you have some direction and some goals. And I like what um, Corey Jacobson was on this podcast. He talked about a book where a Navy SEAL talks about make your bed every day. Jordan Peterson says, clean your room. Yep. Right. He's like, start with yourself before you go out and try to like, uh, change the world. And, and before I go over here and I start to tell Jordan how he needs to be so he can be happier, I pretty much need to work on Gr- Brian first. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, and out of me just trying to improve who I am as a person. Uh, and, and that means like, in my to me like serving others and going out of my way to to make a difference in the world i live in by doing like taking care of my own stuff first i think flowing out of that is a natural uh overflow of improving the lives of everyone around me right like making that difference and and the best part of that is the only thing that you actually control is you you know you can go out and try and help another person but you can only control you and so Focus on improving yourself and helping others. Um, but ultimately, you can give somebody else great information, but what they do with it is going to be up to them. So having that focus and changing yourself and your bad habits is, is a great idea to start with. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of different angles to take in that. One, like realizing that we're all humans and we're all on a journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, hopefully it's a growing journey. And so like we talked about this morning, like, I'm not Tony Robbins and that's fine, but I can help people that Tony Robbins isn't, Mm -hmm. you know, I can, if I'm a a three or four in my personal development, I can help the one, twos and threes, you know, and like, and I can have an impact in where I have influence. And and that's really what I want to focus on. And uh, we don't have to be perfect to do that. Like, I think, you know, that there's two sides to that coin because a lot of people will not take risks and step out and challenge themselves because they have fear. Because they see themselves. We talked about earlier. It's yeah. like, who are you to tell someone how to shoot a shotgun? Who am I to think that I could be a professional <laughs> exhibition shooter? That's a joke. That's l- a laughing stock. Few and people pe- even said that. And people did. Like, Steve, you're not even good. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. But I have the vision, and I'm going to get there. <laughs> right? So, like, realizing you don't have to be perfect to start, but you have to know where you're wanting to go. Right. Like people will come and, and some people will tune into the podcast and I'll do a podcast on, let's say, calling elk or, or how to backpack hunt. You know, I know what I know. I've done it a fair bit, right? It's a, it's a hobby and a passion mm-hmm. and a major interest for me, these things. I know enough that I can teach somebody who has no idea how to do it and greatly improve their odds of success. Now, am I at the level of, you know, this other guy who's done it since he was in his mother's womb, you know, maybe (laughs) not, maybe not. Right. But I still have that ability to help people within my, within, within my level of understanding. How many times do people, because they don't give themselves enough credit or because they realize someone's more skilled than them, how many times do they then kind of put their light under a bushel? How do they, do they hide their, do they not break out, And help other people because they're worried about the fact that they don't know as much as maybe someone else. And that that criticism is coming. And I just did a podcast with Randy Newberg about conservation, about public lands. And Randy made this point. It's like anytime you go out and you're going to talk about public lands and you're going to talk about protecting them, you're going to talk about hunting animals, get ready because the blowback is coming. It's never comfortable. It's always uncomfortable advocacy is always hard when you talk about your faith it's always hard it's also rewarding Mm, yeah and so it's like but if you aren't willing to take the heat to share your ideas and your message you'll never experience the adventure that comes from it well and something that goes along with that that i think is important uh and steve was mentioning it as well is that the person that this podcast reaches um, you may resonate with a certain part of the population that another podcast really doesn't, just that personality, whatever it may yeah. be. And where that really hit home is um, I was a flight instructor for a couple of years and teaching somebody how to land. And you go through all the dynamics of how to teach them how to land an airplane, and they have 
they aren't getting it. I mean, they aren't even putting the, remotely the right controls into it. Right. And so I went through my brain. I was like, I'm going to put this the most backwards way that makes no sense to me. Yeah. Next time, that pilot nailed it. And it completely became clear to him just because it made no sense to me, but it made sense to him. And that's with, you know, I may not be the expert at the top in the world, Mm -hmm. but I have enough knowledge and I may resonate with you that I can get you started on your journey. That reminds me of my wife. So I can, Aaron reminds okay, you of your wife. No, yeah. no, no. That's this, this is more resemblance or resemblance to okay. Suzanne. Here's the deal: you can see it, the no, blonde no. hair, the hey, sandy. Hey, go with me on this for a sec. Okay, my wife. I could sit there. Like today, we had a discussion on like maybe how to squat the the barbell, right? How to do it with better form uh, to get better results. I could tell my wa- wife that, and she'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, got it. Uh huh." She won't hear a word. I, or she'll be like, yeah, that's not really how I've learned to do it. Like the door is closed for business. <laughs> like we are not, she's not, she doesn't listen to a word I say. His wife can come along and take her into the gym and go, this is how you do it. Tell her the exact same thing I do. And my wife will come home from the gym after being out with Jordan's wife and say, do you know what I learned from Jordan today? <laughs> and then she'll go through this motion that I've been trying to tell her about for a year. It's like, oh, great. Yep. That's it. Yep. Sometimes you just don't connect with people, and sometimes sometimes you that's do. your wife. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the with, dynamic. With teaching, I completely understand that. That's the dynamic of marriage. Like I go out and try to work with my wife shooting a shotgun, and like she doesn't want me to teach her. Yeah. You know, she'll be more receptive to somebody else, and that's just sort of mm-hmm. some of the dynamics. But and shooting a bow, same yeah. thing. I don't try to teach my wife. You don't teach your wife. That no, I that don't doesn't go well. well. No, it doesn't. She gets it, mad. It, she gets mad. She gets competitive. She's like, I know this, or or. I'm going to learn from somebody else. And I think a lot of times, often individuals sell themselves shorts, uh, or excuse me, sell themselves short. <laughs> I sold a pair of shorts <laughs> yeah, once. You sold shorts <laughs> once? Yeah, man, man, I am so drunk right now uh, on Ignite. Um, so they, they squander them, they squander opportunity because there are unfortunately individuals in life who suppress others because of where they place themselves in society based on their intellect, their knowledge, their, their understanding of a certain topic or a certain thing. And I always find it fascinating how that those people, there's, there's two type of people in this world, those who charge for it and those who retreat. That's just how it is. You just have in battle, you have no other option. You can sit in the trenches and wait till the enemy comes and overtakes you, or you can charge for it and break their lines and burst through and overcome victory, or you can just simply retreat and play it safe. Mm -hmm. And it's very few people that are willing to be uncomfortable or play it not so safe to find the rewards that Brian and all of you guys are talking about about right here. And what I find really sad is the people who suppress others. For me, I, uh, it's one of the, my biggest pet peeves. So I've got a couple pet peeves. One is buddy or bud. Don't ever call me that. (laughs) Just (laughs) FYI. Don't say, Hey bud. Hey, buddy. It's a weird pet peeve I have because I, I, I'm not your kid brother. Like, I'm a, I'm a grown man. My name's Jordan. Like, I was called buddy when I was, like, a little kid. I like the word, but Jordan and I just have to disagree. We on disagree that. on that. Right. I'm like, dude, I'm I, not. I'm a little bit with you on that. Duly. I don't like bud. Like, somebody just sent me an email the other day, and I know they, they have no idea, but they're like, thanks, buddy. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I say that. You I know what I mean? That. But Aaron doesn't like bud, bro, anything. Yeah. Like, just it's, call me Aaron or call whatnot. Me Aaron. Like. Uh, I'm not Call me square head. Yeah. Sec- second, I got <laughs> all of us have pet peeves. Second pet peeve is I can't, I, I have a low tolerance level for individuals that suppress others because they think that they know more or that they're more authoritative or that they're in a position that merits them more than the other person. My brother Casey said it best. He says, nobody's special. And I said, whoa, what does that mean? I think there's a lot of special people. He says, no, no, no. We're all special. No one person is more special than the other. Uh, yeah. in, if we're talking about in, in a faith-like manner, we are all God's children. Yeah. And he loves us all the same. And we are all perfectly imperfect, but perfectly working to become perfect. And oftentimes we have a lot of... You guys tracking? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're right on with it. You, oftentimes in life, we have a lot of great things to share. And the one thing I just love that Brian just said is like, we have a light in each of us. And that light is either dimmed or it's brightened based on how we're willing to where we are in our life, whether we've self-developed, we've taken care of ourselves because you really can't share your light with others 
until you really have harnessed that light and know how to like let it to shine, be, to let it yeah. shine and be brighter. And a lot of times that light can be brightened through serving other people mm -hmm. because you become unselfish and you're willing to help others. And so often in life, people will take somebody's flame and they'll <laughs> want to put it out and think that that's going to make theirs brighter. And that just never works. And so I just love yeah. what, what we're discussing here because it's something that I truly believe in too, which is through, through individuals who are willing to, to take risks, to charge forward, and to be able to develop something of a knowledge of something and feel comfortable sharing it with others can empower others to do great things that they didn't know they could do themselves. Not everyone's going to relate with Tony Robbins. or no, and Not everybody's going to relate with Brian Collin Gritty. Not everybody's going to relate with Jordan Harbertson or you guys. But at the end of the day, Aaron, what I love that you said is people are just going to pick up things differently. But if you don't put it out there, they're not going to pick up a single thing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that well said, Jordan. I, you just nailed it. You know that uh, it's so funny. I always think of the Incredibles uh, when I hear, you know, when, when uh, <laughs> Flash is sitting there and, and his mom says, you know, everybody's special, Flash. And Flash is like, well, that's just another way of saying nobody's special. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of like what Casey said in the like inverse. The way that Casey right? says it, yeah. Right? Um, but I truly believe, and this comes from, you know, uh, <clears throat> If you look at the Judeo-Christian value, like ethic, that, that all human beings are, have some kind of divine potential or, or all human beings deserve respect or at least you know, love because they're human. And you look at the, the, the bedrock of, of our legal system and what it's built on, it's all men are created equal. And not that all men are created equal in terms of you guys are the same height and the same weight and you, you know, you get the same pay and you get all the same things. No, yeah. all men are created equal in the chance that they, they all have an uh, equal level of potential to be great because they have like a divine spark in of the, something in, in their unique ways, in their unique ways. Yeah. So, so in that regard, it doesn't matter how deplorable or how awful or how wretched a person is that individual has value just because they exist. When you look at the world that way, it doesn't mean that you sit aside and let someone horrible take advantage of you or you, 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 you accept evil from someone. But it does mean that you look at that individual and you still have mercy, pity, and, and love for them in spite of the, the disaster that they are simply because that they're human and when you look at humanity in that way to me that that is the key difference from society today in many ways to what it was over the last million years and what what you see in contrast to that is a society like Hitler's Nazi Germany or the the gulag archipelago in the Soviets Soviets gulag you 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 see where other humans treated other humans as subhuman or as com having no value, treating them like worse than a rodent. They would treat a, a bug. And to, to, to have the ability, and I think all human beings, we, we have the potential to easily go down a dark path. And if we do that and indulge that, then it doesn't take much for us to, to take a person and put them into the category of insect and then treat them that way. And I think, you know, to what Jordan is saying, I don't like that because I see it as bullying. I see it as putting yourself above someone else. Instead of being grateful for your position in life, instead of being grateful for who you are and that, that you have, have, are, are in a good place, and that instead of being grateful for, for the family and the, and the support group that you have, and then, and then feeling compassion for someone who's not there. Instead, there's no gratitude in you. Instead, you, you hate others that are doing better than you. That, that to me is a, just a dark path that too many people fall into. And that's where I, I think, you know, like what you're saying, all ships rise together is something that we say all the time. You know, as I 
<clears throat> help people that I think are positive and make a difference in the world and they help me, we all rise together. That means when Jordan is successful or you guys are successful or my wife or my sister or my brother are successful in what they do, I don't harbor jealousy for it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not jealous of their success. Instead, I celebrate it. And that's not, that's not easy to do. That's not easy. It's not. And I think that's more apparent in this social, social media age where we can look at everybody's highlight reel and compare it to our real life. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I've got, gotten trapped in that comparison, comparison, compa comparison. Oh, look how well they're doing. Look how great they're doing. And that there's really no room for that. Like you can go on social media, but if you take the attitude of look how great they're doing, that's awesome. That's great that they are living up to their potential or they're stepping out and exploring new ways and they're being successful and, and not compare it to where we're at because realizing we're all on different journeys, you know, and that's, what's important is, am I living out my journey? Am I stepping out in faith? Am I facing fears? Am I becoming all that God's created me to be? And when people back to the original question, are we special? They're like, yes and no. All we are is two people that took, what we believed was a calling, stepped out in faith, conquered some fears, took courage, and kept stepping out, kept making ourselves vulnerable until it became something really cool. And I think every individual has some type of spark or potential in there to do some really cool things, and it looks different for everyone. It may not be shooting a shotgun backwards <laughs> right, or from the <laughs> hip or over your head or doing a push-up and being legendary at that, <laughs> but... It's, it's everybody to the points in which all three of you have expressed so beautifully. It's finding, it's one, finding your light. It's finding that spark, that divine from within and willing to go and explore it and to excavate it. And to, I mean, I, you guys have used the word faith a lot, right? And the scriptures say faith yeah. without works is dead. And as much as we can have faith, it also takes a lot of work to to keep faith. Yeah. You know, Lord, Lord asks us to go out and to exercise our faith. And I think that's so important when we, I always, I always believe and love, and I have a father who raised a family on, um, the, uh, the principle of attitude. And I always talk about that because faith is something that we decide inside that we want to, we, we believe it's a choice. It's a choice. We have a choice every day to, to place faith in something. Right. And, and in this discussion, we've we've talked about faith in in bettering ourselves or, or faith in, our, in a higher power in our in our savior, Jesus Christ, or in, or in his his father. And, and these are things that take work and these are things that take time to develop. But it's through faith that we're able to take the steps necessary of those of hope. And it's the attitude that is needed in order for us to really, truly achieve our divine potential, because. This, this America, this country that, that uh, you know, Brian's alluding to earlier that I just, I'm so thankful and grateful for is it is a land of opportunity. Yeah. It's yeah. a land where anybody could become a professional shotgun clay shooting but they should. duo. But they shouldn't. <laughs> but they shouldn't, you know, because that's already taken. You yeah, know? Yeah. We, don't, we've got don't that discuss, locked down. We've got it. And anybody can start a podcast. And they are. <laughs> Everybody is starting a podcast right now. And guess what, guys? There's about 20 million outdoor nutritional supplement companies starting. What? And everybody, this is where Brian's point, I think, is just so crucial to the discussion. And what his attitude is and how he just described it, which is at the end of the day, if another duo comes along and becomes more successful than the two of you at shows and a YouTube channel with 2 million followers or whatever it is, or another person comes along and is able to take some significant market share from Mountain Ops and become a successful supplement company in the outdoors, or another guy decides to find his niche and finds a success in empowering others through his podcast. Guess what? Bravo. That is awesome. Because that just means, to Aaron's point, that's another opportunity for another individual to impact some more people that maybe wouldn't have been impacted by this podcast, this duo, or this company. And that is okay because the world needs more of that. The world needs more people to inspire and empower others to do hard things and to become better people than they were today for their future self. And that is, and Brian said it best, that is hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie to you guys at this table and say that I don't fight that ego every day. 
Can I, just, can I be real honest here for just a second? Yeah. Because a little little story about something, a lot, what you're talking about that just happened for me and us. We're brothers. Mm-hmm. We may not always get along. That just might be the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, so not long ago, we were having a little bit of a, some friction between us and, and going along with what you said, you know, we're, we're competitive between one another, you know. As brothers should be. As well, brothers got, should be. I've got two sets of brothers in this room. I've got you guys. I've got you. We're just missing Casey, and we'd have the Trinity here. Yeah, yeah. But so, brothers are competitive by bro- nature. Brothers are competitive, and that can be good with the right mindset, yep. with the right, with the right and, attitude. And, you know, I I know that I'd been in the recent past had been kind of jealous. You know, like if he if he succeeded, or looked better on a video, or you know had a better show than I did, like. Yeah, it's both of us, but I know deep down inside I was having a little bit of that. You're harboring some feelings. I, I, I wish I would have been doing better. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have been doing better. And um, through this conversation that we had here um, recently, all of a sudden it hit me, you know. I was like, I should be Steve's biggest fan. If he succeeds and and it's not my best show, it doesn't matter. Uh, Steve, I'm Steve's biggest fan. If he has a great show, if he does a great shot, and like you said, uh, Jordan, every day you got to put that in the right place because we all kind of want to be selfish. Mm-hmm. We all want to take it and make it ours, and someone does something better than us. You know, I mean, we, we were only a little bit off from winning today, but we lost. Dude, by a half a freaking rep, dude. <laughs> a s- like less than a millisecond. But, but we have to recognize that. And Silver medalist, Get man. it tomorrow. Yeah, and you know what I just love that you said there is, is just like you're his biggest fan. I have to do this with my brother Casey. I watch these two do it in the office from day to day too. <laughs> As we're brothers, it's different, right? And, and we talked about this at dinner the other night. It's really easy to disregard a, be, a person when, when you're in somewhat of a partnership or somewhere doing something together. And, and, and they're like, ah, well, you're not really family. And you're obviously, I'm finding out you're really not my friend. So I think I can just cut you out of my life. It's really hard to cut your brother out of your <laughs> life. Um, I know people do that, but that's just sad. Yeah. And so to hear your guys' story of how you guys were kind of diverged as far as from your, mm-hmm. your pa- the meaningful past in your life and how you then converged because of the Lord and because of what, how that, that brought you together. I, I believe wholeheartedly in that things take time to naturally come to existence, but it's based on us being willing to be open-minded and to take those risks and, and be able to run with those opportunities when they do come. Like I look at this guy right here to my, to my right. I mean, this is a guy that, that I feel like at Mountain Ops, we have a, a core value and belief. And I shared this with you guys, our number one core value and belief. And for everybody watching, if you think this is like a Bible discussion, <laughs> yeah, it's we're It sort of went there. It's, and it's okay. You know why? Because this is our beliefs at this table. Hey, and you, it's maybe, gritty. It's that, gritty. That, I, I, you I, may resonate I with it. it as rig, it's gritty. Yeah, That's and right. all of you God listening, is gritty. <laughs> if you believe in something, whether it's God or, or something, believe in something more than yourself, right? Something that drives you to be better. That's good. Do that. But it's just the, the, the principle of, you know, you guys are, I think are just a, a great, um, you're a great example of people that, you know, have, have, have come to where you are because of decisions that you made that were divinely interventions. And I, at Mountain Ops, we just believe in that so much. And sometimes it's interesting to see people come back and say things like, man, you guys, like I read your core values and belief. Like, why did you have God in there? Like our number one core value and belief is we recognize God and his hand in all things. And uh, because we believe as a company, as an organization, as a partnership, as all the people that we have to work with, that we believe that he has his hand in all of that. And so it's really cool to hear your guys' story. And it's really fascinating to see where you guys are now. And even in the discussions that the four of us have had at the <laughs> sushi table and the dinner table, um, to your, your, your passions, when Brian talks about we believe like in the why, I love the target-focused life. And when you think about the three circles that we talked about at dinner, the, the why, the how, and the what is a, literally a target, right? If laying mm-hmm. upright, it's three rings, and you're mm-hmm. shooting for the middle, and then you work out from there. Yeah. And, uh, I like and, that. And so it's uh, – gosh, it's, it's yeah. just 
Yeah, I love positive things. I think you guys are good positive people. I think I've I've really enjoyed our conversation today and and uh, I really enjoyed beating you guys this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we still partner, got tomorrow. With my partner, Steve. Uh, <laughs> and he excels nice at job. the physical aspect, so right. he should win. Nice job, Steve. Yeah. Uh, you two, you guys. You get. You did good. Yeah. I, I, you you know what? Good. I'm not a sore loser. <laughs> but what I was going to say. I love, I love what we did today. I, like I said, it's easier said than done to celebrate someone's success when they're competing against you yes. in some way. And we're all competitive or we wouldn't be in this room doing what we're doing. Yeah. You know, so having that competitive drive is, is a good thing. I don't want it to ever go away, uh, but I can still celebrate someone's success. And then at the same time, dig deep so I can beat them next time. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. and instead of me wallowing in victimhood and saying it's not fair, or they cheated to win or something like that. I, I can sit there and go, bravo. Good for you. I'm so happy for you, I'm but com- I'm coming for you. And that makes everybody better. It does. It makes yeah. everybody better. And to me, at the root of all of that, though, is ego. Yep. Uh, ego. And when you talk about it, you can get ego, I think. We talked about this before. We read the book Ego is the Enemy. We did a podcast on that a while back. I think it's critical, especially in this YouTube social media space that we're involved in. Ego is the enemy. It can rob you of all the things that you want, every, all the things that you are, and all the things you could be. Mm. And that's ego. It's pride. And so every day is a daily roll call. So when I feel an emotion of jealousy, when it creeps up in the moment it happens and I'll be scrolling through Instagram or I'll have someone, you know, do something that, that I, that I observe, I'm jealous. When I feel that emotion, that's my roll call. That's my reminder. Like every day I have to check ego every day. I have to I have to be aware of it, watching for it, and on alert for it. And as soon as that comes up, boom, at that moment, I have to redirect. I yeah. have to stop myself and go, no, no, you don't get to be jealous over this. You, you, get, to be, you get to celebrate this. And, and then you get to work harder, you know? Yep. And that roll call, that process, is something that you're, I work on all the time. And I constantly think, developing. I think if you don't, if you don't actively – and this goes back to you guys leaving a target focused life or an intentional life. If you don't wake up every day on guard, that ego will slip in. You don't even know it's there. And before you know it, all you do is talk about how everybody else is getting the shake and you're not and how it's not fair yeah. and how and pretty soon instead of you celebrating others' successes like you should, instead you're whining about them and and you're wallowing in your own self pity and you're not going anywhere. Yeah. I think one habit that someone can create, and I, I don't do this every day, and I want to get more consistent, but when I do, I notice it changes my whole day, is start my day getting up, not getting on social media, not checking into all these things that are sort of distractions at times, but starting my day with some focused time. I like to read, but then I also like to spend time in gratitude. When yeah. I can look at my life, when it's quiet in the morning before my kids are up, say, just be grateful. Mm-hmm. Thank you for this house. Thank you for this opportunity to be alive today, to work, to do the things that I'm doing, to be in the country for the fresh air, for the fresh water, for the clean clothes I have. You know, you can get down to the smallest details, but when you start to put your mind in a gratitude mindset, it's huge. Yeah, like it's you all You realize attitude. how much yep. you have to be grateful for. Yep. And it, I don't know that it necessarily matters what position you're in. I mean, you could be... Man, I haven't been there, so I'm speaking a little bit out, but you could be down in your luck. But if you're in this country, you can go through a gratitude list. You can go, yeah. I'm glad that I'm in the United States. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful I can speak English. I'm thankful that I have a few good friends. I'm thankful that I have clean water to drink today. You know, and if you got I'm thankful those, that I have the best shotgun shooting partner in the world. In and the world. <laughs> yes. I, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, I wasn't going and, there, but an <laughs> attitude of gratitude. Yeah, yeah. An attitude. I, I think that's a self attitude you can see. That's yeah. a self development <laughs> thing that you know they always say your attitude will determine your altitude in life. And yeah, I appreciate you guys coming on the podcast. I I would like to uh, sit down again sometime and actually talk about shooting. Yeah, like how do you hit the clay pigeon? Like <laughs> that's just a. 
basic that sometimes I struggle with. And it's That's no about better a, with a feathered bird. I'd like really I, like to learn that before tomorrow. Yeah. It's about a 15 second conversation. <laughs> oh, so really? We might want to have other topics to discuss. <laughs> like whitetails. Oh, oh, I love talking or, whitetails. Or, you uh, point or, and shoot. Yeah. Like, come it's on. Like, it's like For a jet. For some reason, I feel like it's more complicated. Uh, I'll teach you. I'll teach you. You literally, uh, you look down the barrel, there's a bead. Um, when that clay <laughs> arrives at that bead, you pull the trigger. It's like shooting a turkey in the face. Nailed it. You <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> no more to discuss. Yeah, we've arrived. You and I are going to start yeah. our duo. We're going to be the next clay shooting Yay! extraordinaire. Yeah. Yeah, right. Trick shooters. No. Um, not us. You where guys. can people find you guys? Yeah. I mean, best place, YouTube, Instagram. You just search Gould Brothers. You'll find us. Otherwise, uh, on our website, gouldbrothers.com. Of course, we've got our schedule where we have live appearances. We perform all across the country. And that's really where you, what you've got to come see. The videos are cool. And we could do things that we'll never do live. But we, we've heard it from people over and over it's the that, shows, that watch the, the videos shows. and they come watch the live show. They love the live shows. I don't know why. We miss periodically. We're, we're humans. You see our raw side. You see us make mistakes. But I think that's also what people enjoy. I've and, heard it said that uh, your guys' show is the Cirque du Soleil of shotgun shooting. <laughs> With a few less flips. <laughs> yes. Less flips and we no water. And flips. And guys, no weird costumes. We can do that, You guys though. wear yeah. tights? Yeah. We should. <laughs> yeah, nah. My, my body we form we should not. awful strange and tight, so <laughs> let me just say that. But uh, if there's any listers down in the Florida area, we do have a show coming up. August 25th. Uh, we 25th do? August 25th. This month? Yeah. We're actually, it's actually a meet and greet at Okeechobee Shooting Sports. We're going to be down there. I don't know that we'll be putting on a live show, but you can come hang out with us, shoot with us. It's going to be a pretty cool deal. There will be other YouTubers there, so that would be a great opportunity. Yeah. So uh, goldbrothers.com is just – G-O- gold, gold or Gould? Yep. G O U L D. Yeah. The brothers. <laughs> brothers. And then Instagram is the same. No underscore. No Correct. dot. Yep. No, just G O U L D. Brothers. Yeah. Okay. Then you'll just find him, Steve Gold. You find his personal page. And you'll find Aaron yeah. Gold. S- Steve Gould X. Aaron Gould X. That's You've got him. If you want to see the big deer, you come to my page. <laughs> my, my stuff, so. If you want to hear the, the motivational things of how he did so many things, he just couldn't get the buck. You go to <laughs> Steve's page, right? <laughs> this, this is his year. I have a feeling this is Steve's year. You two are funny because you sound like Casey and Jordan. You are the older <laughs> brother. You are me. You were all into it growing up, and you kind of came along later like I did. And, yeah. yeah. And made Casey, the older brother jealous because you excelled so fast. Yeah, and, yeah. It's just it's hard. <laughs> it's hard being the younger brother. It is. It's better than the bigger it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Love it, guys. Thanks so much for yeah, having us. You Thank too. You. As always, stay gritty. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>